Welcome to Trailblazers Impact Podcast. I'm Nan McKay, and our other show hosts and I bring to life inspiring stories of the memories and the barriers encountered to persevere as female role models determined to go under, over, around, or through every obstacle encountered. Listen to our trailblazers who actively created new paths for other women to follow, providing innovations in products, services, and ways of thinking, and who continue to empower other women through the sharing of their time, talent, and treasure to encourage them to pursue their passion. Our website is trailblazersimpact.com and you can contact us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. Hear our voices as we provide podcasts, read our blogs, attend our live events, and write your own testimonial on our website, spotlighting a woman who inspired you to create your own path. Hello, my name is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you to Beverly Kuykendall. Beverly is president of government business for the American Medical Depot. And Beverly and I met at a NABO conference, and I heard her speak and say, I need that person on my podcast. (laughs) One of the things I was just most impressed with, and you have a lot of credentials to your name, but one of them is that you were recognized as one of the 50 most powerful minority women in business. I mean, that is huge, along with a lot of other accolades. So let's start out by just sort of talking about how you have lived out your passion in life. I, I Thank you, Nan, and thank you so much for asking me to participate in your podcast. It was wonderful to meet you at NABO. I, I would love to be able to say that I had a magnificent plan that was well laid out, a project plan with trends and goals and objectives, and it started out at Chapter 1 and it went all the way through the end, and this is where I am today. But that would not be fair uh, to, to your listeners, and it also, I Or to offer an opinion, my, my hand goes straight up quickly and fast. 
I'm making a contribution. Well, the interesting thing is that you have made some serious big contributions to humanity through AMD, you know, that um, delivering 1 million hygiene kits to Syrian refugee. Uh, I mean, that's, um, that's amazing. Tell me about some of these things and how you've lived out, not just your business side of you, which is very important, but how you have also lived out the humanitarian side of you. American Medical Depot was given the opportunity to make a contribution to the to the Syria refugee effort, and I happened to be in the office of a major um, purchaser or procurement officer with the Department of Defense, and someone that I knew very well. And he, I came into his office and he had his head, his hand on his head, and I said, "I'm going to say his name." I said, well, it, "What's the problem?" And he said, "I've been allotted." $3 million to, for us to make a contribution to the Syrian refugee effort because the United States wants to make a contribution. We, we're not sure exactly how we want to do that, but if we can participate from a humanitarian perspective, that would give us the latitude that we need to go further. And I said, great, that sounds wonderful. What, what's the issue? He said, well, I can't figure out how to spend the money. And, and we have to respond very quickly, and I need to be able to find a company that can do it. I said, well, may I take a look at it? He says, you, we have to reach, forever you didn't hear me. We have to respond within five working days. <laughs> and I don't think you can do it. Now, my mother would say, well, of course you could do it. Find a way. I said, Roger, here I am giving this name. I said, give me an opportunity, and let me take a look at it. I saw it. I said, I am sure that we can do this. I immediately got on the phone, called uh, the president of our company, and said, I think we can do this. Can I say yes? And he said, what is it? And I said, can I say yes? And we're very good. AMP is a very good solution provider to the federal government. And I felt all the confidence in the world as he told me to go forward and tell them yes. We said yes. Within three days, um, we had deployed uh, Congressman uh, Kendrick Meek, who was on our board, and Akhil Agarwal, the president of our company, to Syria to have this, because we had to source those kids in country. They wanted to make sure that if the United States was participating, that we were finding some way to make an impact on the local economy. So the best way to do that is for the supplies to buy the supplies in country and then develop a partnership with a company in country. And we were, we were there. The United States government funded the entire thing. And it was a wonderful opportunity. There were a lot of trials and tribulations, but we were able to do it. And at the end of the day, we met the challenge, we met the requirement, 1,089,000 Assyrian refugee kids. The United States looked great. AMD had an opportunity to participate, and that's really what we do, is to provide that kind of service as a medical surgical product distribution company. Now, I'm, so I'm imagining this. Um, so you get into Syria, and part of the concern on the United States part is being sure that the kits really are getting delivered to the people who actually need them rather than just the government? Yes. Yes. So what did you do to ensure that? Well, through the U.S. Um, Aid for International Development, USAID, that's really what they do. So everything goes through them. We provide the kits to them. Uh, and then they already have AMD. AMD. The United States had already deployed um, uh, refugee uh, assistance on ground to make sure that we have people that are there. And it's really all part of a, of a very important supply chain when emergencies take place. And so the, the personnel and the logistics are already there. We just have to provide the product. And the key piece for that is that they wanted us to make a contribution to the local economy, so we had to buy the product in country. Oh. Out of some of the products. We actually had to finance the company that was in Syria to be able to purchase the supplies. So we had to go to our bankers, get a, extend a line of credit overseas, which was not easy. I, thank goodness I happened to be working with some geniuses. That was not easy. And we had, that gave us the opportunity to really fulfill that requirement. Wow. You know, the other thing that you talked about and that, that I remember about you is that 
you also provided medical supplies for more than 60 VA medical centers. Um, tell me how you got that. You're, you're just known as, I think, the guru on government contracting, which is, you know, big. <laughs> but how did you put this stuff together? And not just how did you put it together, but that's that humanitarian side again. It's so great to meld the two. So uh, imagine, so the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, VA Medical Centers, there are 152 of them across the country, and they're charged with the mission of taking care of our veterans that come back um, from these various wars and their families. And so um, it's an acute care hospital uh, system. It is very important that we serve them, serve them well. It's, a, it's an entire supply chain. The AMD, I call us a 25-year overnight success because we've been doing business with the federal government for many, many years. And you don't bid on one contract and then you're awarded that contract. It takes time and time again to understand exactly how the government works to make sure that you're putting forth the right kind of a solution. And as a result, AMD was awarded a $1.2 billion contract to service the VA hospitals along the eastern seaboard. There were three other companies that were all also awarded different areas of the country, and all of their awards were about a billion dollars as well. Um, ours was, we were the only small business on that bid. In federal contracting, there's something called a multiple award, if you will, so the government had a $5 billion requirement. It was a multiple award that was made to four, com four companies, and we were divided by region. And AMD, um, in order for us to do that, we had to increase our personnel. We had to increase the number of warehouses that we had across the country in order to service those facilities. We had to deliver, we had to make sure that we had the right kind of transportation. We had to put together a logistics system. We put together some internal processes that helped us to do that. Now, we've been doing business with the federal government for many, many years, 25 years, but now we had to put an exponent behind that and really build and prepare in order to be able to service this particular contract. And so very fortunate to be able to do so. It it's, sounds like it has a lot of moving parts. Uh, yes. Now, you're talking about things that have happened fairly recently, but going back, I mean, you must have incurred, encountered some hurdles and obstacles and discrimination along the way. Tell us a little bit about that and, you know, how you dealt with some of that stuff. Oh, my goodness. I would, well, just imagine. I was born in 1955. I graduated from undergrad in 1978. And so that may seem like a contemporary time to some people but it was very different. And I talk about being the one and only, and even today, I say being the one and only, they're, they're, things should have changed by now, and in some ways they really have. They really have. Um, however, during that time, I, my first job out of college was with Procter & Gamble Distribution Company. I think, I, thank goodness I had pre really prepared um, myself. My mother really prepared us. But I remember, just a funny story, I remember my very first interview, and I... My father worked for Ford Motor Company. He wore overalls for a long time, and then finally he became a salesman. But I didn't have uh, the kind of a background where people could prepare me for going into a corporate environment. Just didn't have the exposure. And so I go tracing into my first job interview with Procter & Gamble, and I'm uh, white, black, and green dashiki, and some white patent leather shoes, and my hair in an afro. And thank God someone had seen me that I had gone to school with, and he must have seen me from a window. This was, um, they had an office in Orange County. And he comes running out of the office. I see the young man. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to my job interview with Dr. Gamble. He said, no, you're not. Not looking like that. He was a dear friend. And he talked to me. Because sometimes you need people to talk to you. And back then, I needed somebody to talk to me. And he said, you need to fix your hair. I said, fix my hair. Now, now we've gone back, and it's a wonderful thing. Now we can wear our hair natural, but not in 1978. He said, you need to buy a brown suit a blue suit, and a gray suit. You go out and buy three white button-down shirts, and at that time we were wearing the small little ties. Remember the John T. Malloy mm -hmm. Justice Success? He showed me what kind
kind of pumps to wear, thank goodness. And I went back for the job interview after that. But I thought it was funny at the time because you, you just don't know. If you don't know any better, if you haven't seen anything, you do the best that you can. I didn't have any friends that had ever had that experience at the time. And so now, fast forward, I do, I get the job, and I am ecstatic. We get a company car, we get an expense allowance, <laughs> and it was a wonderful, really a wonderful experience. But I was going into grocery stores in neighborhoods that I was not necessarily familiar with. And it's, it's interesting because people make assumptions based on how you look. And I also think if, if even if people don't consider themselves, um, I won't say that it's, it's racist, but I'll say we're accustomed to what we have been exposed to. And if the only thing you've been exposed to is, for example, a woman uh, depicting herself like the mother on Leave the Beaver, that's what your expectation is when you see women. If your expectation of African Americans is of a woman and, and she's a maid, that's what your expectation is. Mm-hmm. And so it's not your fault. It's just the way it is. So the challenge is really upon us when we are the one and only to make sure, right, that you can't wear it on your shoulder. You have to get over it. And this is what I tell people. When you wake up in the morning, you're still going to look the same pretty much in the mirror. <laughs> you're still going to be a woman for the most part, right? I know things are changing. And you're still going to be, you know, white, black, brown, purple, green, whatever that is. So it's up, it's incumbent upon you to figure out what you're going to do so that you make it through the day and that you can achieve your goal. It's not on anybody else. It's not an old poor me and they need to treat me better. It's you going after it and doing the very best you can. And many times that means, as I said before, speaking up in the room, really pushing yourself, making sure that you are making a difference, being afraid and doing it anyway, right? The definition of of bravery. So you're the only one, if you're in a sales meeting, they're asking for contributions in order to be able to to solve a a problem or to to overcome a challenge, and you have got to speak up. And I think that that was a lesson I learned very, very early on, in particular the part about not being so sensitive and thinking and taking so many things personally. I will tell you, Nan, right now, it is really, really hard to hurt my feelings. <laughs> it's really hard. I just, we just keep going. And I've seen women do that over and over and over again. We just keep going. It's okay. They insulted me, but you know what? I got to get up and go back the next day. Hey, I'm not going to whine about it because that doesn't serve anyone. No, when you whine and you cower, it's almost like they won right away. And she says, when she gets on stage, doesn't that tell you that we need to have 
have more representation in the Senate, more women, more people of color, so that people can assume you're anything. You could be anybody. There was another story that was told uh, about a woman who was a CEO, and she's on a private jet. She's been invited on a private jet. And the, the, the pilot and the stewardess are standing there, and they're saying, you know, you're late. You're late. And she's looking around and saying, well, what do you mean I'm late? Well, you know, we're waiting. We're, you need to go. You need to get off the plane and go talk to your people right now. Thinking, what are they talking about? Well, they think she's the caterer, the catering oh, helper. Oh. She's actually been invited to go meet with how it's so to stop us, or whoever it was that she was meeting with. So it's, just, it's a matter of expanding people's horizons, and that's just a, people making, not being racist, but just not being able to open your mind that you can have people that are leading countries that don't necessarily have one type of look. You can have a woman who is a leader. You can have a Latina who's a leader. You can have an African American who's a leader. You can have a woman of Asian descent who is a leader. You don't know what it can look like. What's important is what they bring to the table. And so in addition to the, in, the high degree of intelligence and very great emotional intelligence, they also have to bring to the table the ability to say, you know, I'm going to brush this off and I'm just going to demonstrate to them. Because imagine if you don't say a word, once people recognize who you are, once they made that mistake, they'll never make that mistake again. They'll be thoroughly embarrassed. And maybe we'll think twice the next time. And that's really what you want them to do. I, you know, you asked me for a personal example. I, now, my last name is Kuykendall. K-U-Y-K-E-N-D-A-L-L. It is my father's name. My father is from Arkansas. My father is African-American. We just did his, his DNA, and he's like 90% Nigerian. Uh, my mother's from Louisiana. And so um, many times, I, and I've learned how to use things to my advantage. So I'll have someone call and make an appointment for me when I have my business. And they come in, someone will come into the waiting room and say, Beverly Kuykendall? And I stand up and they go, no, no, we're looking for Beverly Kuykendall. Mm -hmm. so that's me. I'm not Smith. I'm not Jones. Uh, and I purposely have someone else make the call. I'm Beverly Kuykendall. And so you, you learn to leverage that and to use it. And I, I believe that the, the differences that we can bring, that the differences that women bring, that people of color, just making sure that there's diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of frame of reference, we can solve any challenge that you put before us if you bring the best minds to the table. And they may not always look the way you think they might. Exactly. What do you think is the hardest thing you've ever had to do? I think that is a very good question. What is the most difficult thing? I, I will tell you, um, so making the decision um, that I would uh, sell my company, leave my company, and, and join another company um, was a very difficult decision for me. And uh, the, 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 my business partners happened to be very, very long-time friends. And we came to an agreement, and so I decided to do that, and I'm doing it now. But the most difficult thing is for me is learning how to lead versus manage and understanding the difference between those two and that what people really need from me today is my ability to lead, to look at the strategic objectives and to make sure that I'm communicating those strategic objectives, objectives and, and helping other people to understand how they can make, best make a contribution towards those. Leading means looking farther ahead, communicating, as I said, the, the strategies and the objectives, where's the company going, where's the mission, what is the mission, and how do you, as a worker or even a manager, how do you participate in that? How do you continue to move that forward so that we're accomplishing the goal? And we look down the road uh, a year from now and five years from now, we can say, here's what we said we, would, we were going to do, and here's what we accomplished. How do you keep people motivated to walk with you? I think of a story, uh, I think what Kim Chenault talked about what, of uh, American Express. What is really, what is the definition of leadership? And he said from his perspective, and I agree with this, leadership is that you are going up a very steep hill, and there are millions of people following you. As an example, they can't see what's on the other side, but they're following you because they believe in you. 
and you have accurately described the vision. And I said, that is a very good example of what leadership is. They may not know, but they believe in your vision as a leader because you they respect you, they respect your brilliance, they respect your heart, because you have to really win over the hearts and minds of people to get them to truly follow you and to buy into your mission. And I think that my the most difficult piece for me is moving, transitioning from managing to leading. I like that statement because I teach executive management and one of the things we talk about is leadership and basically define it as a leader is someone that other people want to follow. Absolutely. And they have to follow you while you are holding them to the highest possible standard. So another essence of leadership is holding your people, our people, to the highest possible standard while take, teaching them and taking the best possible care of them at the same time, challenging them. And they're, they're meeting your challenge because they understand what you're trying to accomplish and they fall into it. Can you think back to what you would describe as one of the very best moments of your life? I will tell you. So many years ago, uh, my husband and I owned a medical supply distribution company. And we were selling to our local hospital. And we had one warehouse. We won a, a nice contract with the Department of Veterans Affairs to service um, this local hospital. Small contract. And we were doing well. We had a warehouse in Torrance, California, and we bought a couple of trucks, and we had relationships with manufacturers, and we would go to the hospital, we would take orders, the hospitals would order from us, we would buy the product from the manufacturer, we put it on our truck, hold it for the hospital, and then deliver it on a just-in-time basis when they wanted. It was beautiful. Local business, local office, my children would come by the office after school, it was great. And then in 1992, the government decided they were going to reinvent government. And when they reinvented government, what they were endeavoring to do was really to cut down on their expenses, which they should do. And the way they were going to do that is for all 152 of the VA facilities, they were going to go back out to bid, and they were going to divide the, the territory into three. Now imagine, this, we had 11 hospitals in our local area, and there are 152 hospitals. And they decided that they're going to divide that in three. So basically about 50 hospitals per contractor. And this was in 92. And so they that means you had to have a computer. You had to be able to take orders over what, what was called uh, electronic data interchange. And at that time, we barely had a computer. Maybe we had one. And that was for everybody. So we thought, my husband said, mm, this is going to be a problem. We're probably going to be losing our business if they go this route. And I said, well, I have some questions. He said, well, there's a hearing in Chicago with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Why don't you go so we can get first-hand knowledge? I said, okay, I will. I get on the plane, I go to Chicago, and I go into a, a hall. It's at a hotel, and it seems to be a 1,000 people in that room. And there's a microphone, three microphones at the front, hundreds of seats, and about eight people on the stage. And people are going up with the public hearing. The government is rolling out this new reinventing government initiative, and people are going to the microphone and they're asking questions. Now, I had already taken a look at the federal acquisition regulations and the code of federal regulations and some of the public policy, public law, 100-656 and 95507, that talk about that the government must provide the maximum practicable opportunities for small businesses to do business. And I looked at that, and I thought, well, we're a small business, and we're doing business, but through this new initiative, we're going to lose that opportunity because we can't compete. I can't service 50 hospitals. So let me just ask the question. I keep, I'm looking at my papers, and I'm waiting, man, for someone to ask my question. And nobody's asking. They're complaining, and they're saying that they're going to lose their business. And I keep looking at my paper, and I think, you know what? I'm going to have to go to the microphone and ask this question in front of all these people. So I go from the back of the room, this is why you never sit in the back of the room, all the way to the front of the microphone, and I'm looking down at my sheet of notes that I've taken, and I say, well, according to Part 52 of the Federal Acquisition Regulation, it says that I start citing the regulation 
and as it relates to small business. And I noticed this noise, this rustling on the stage. It's the lawyers on the stage speaking through books and manuals. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. They hadn't anticipated that question. Oh my goodness. So I, I, my confidence is even more, more, more built up. And so I ask another question. Same rustling. And I think, oh my goodness. Oh, spooky, spooky. Now I think I've got them. <laughs> well, I was feeling very, very good about myself. And after that, one of the lawyers came down from the stage, asked me who sent me. I said, my husband sent me. He started laughing. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Southern California. He said, you know, Congresswoman Maxine Waters sits on the very small business appropriations committee for the agency that's about to, to, to implement this new reinventing government. Can you get to her? I said, I think I can. I'm from California. I know some people who know some people who know some people. And so I had an opportunity to talk with one of her aides. She wrote a letter of inquiry. When she wrote that letter of inquiry, and I had, I had to do some research, provide the information so that they understood, right? You're a congressional representative. You have many issues that are before you. You have staff people that are bringing you certain issues. They're really fine-tuning it for you. They're studying it. So I write the white paper. She writes her letter of inquiry. It stops the whole thing. The government stops the requirement. They go back. They retrench. They rewrite the certification for the inclusion of small business. All right. That's my goodness, it was, I was, it was the most amazing thing I had ever experienced. I felt very humble and very, very good about the change that I was able to help take place. And after that, I started a trade organization. And I have to say, I did not do it alone. I worked with a group of people who believed in what I was doing. They also stood to risk losing their businesses. And so we all walked through this together. We walked the halls of the Rayburn Building the Cannon Building and the Long Work Building in Washington, D.C., meeting with congressional representatives, pleading our case, and that really made a significant difference. So that is probably one of the proudest moments. Outside of having my children, I'm so proud of them, but that really made me think, I, I have a voice. I've got something that I can really contribute here. And if anybody can get things done for you, it's Maxine Waters. Yeah, that's exactly right. Oh, yeah. The old, oh, I, I, I just love her. She's a very bold individual. And that really helped. She, she, she was, she's smart. She understood, and she helped us to get that done. That's fantastic. So you talked about your children. How did your family feel about your work-life balance? You know, it's so interesting that you should say that. I think, so, I, I think it was difficult because I, I have always, since that time, I've always traveled. Um, I I happen to be married to a wonderful man, and I say that because this man thinks I can walk on water. And I tell young women, if you meet someone and you tell them your dream, and they try to talk you out of your dream, run. Don't walk. Absolutely. As fast as you can away from that person because you will not be happy. Uh, and I, I, I believe in compromise, and you can compromise, but if you have an itch or you feel really compelled to do something, you, are, I would say people are neurotic because they're here, they're put on this earth to accomplish a specific task, and when they can't figure out what that is, they're just a little neurotic. They, they lose their place. They lose their footing. And so I happen to uh, be married to a man from the Midwest. Um, his mother, for very many years, did not work, and he talks about the difference in his life with his mother before she started working. Now, his father was in the home. Father worked hard. There were 12 children. But he talks about his mother before she started working and after she started working and how her whole countenance, her whole demeanor, her whole attitude, her personality changed. And that told him, when I get married, I want my wife to do whatever whatever she feels like she needs to do. And so I, that, you know, I think God brought us together. It's a, it's a perfect match. And so he always said, and in fact, um, so my family is a little different. They, they don't understand. And I tell people, I can go to Congress and I can go to the White House and talk to whomever, but when I get home, I'm going to Mother's Day. I still, they're still expecting me to go empty mom's trash. They have doesn't care. <laughs> they don't care who I am or where I'm speaking or what kind of awards I've won. And, some, and, and that's very good because family keeps you grounded. But I think that, um, yes, yeah, it's been... It'd be interesting to have someone ask one of my sisters. They know that my life is a little different. I'm the only one who's moved away from home out of, out of our siblings. Um, 
my mom and dad are still there. My three sisters and my brother, they're all still there in Southern California. I moved to Florida because that was part of my deal. Uh, when I came on board with American Medical Depot, they can't believe I, you moved out of your house. Oh, my God. And then, Jan, my husband and I, for three years, of, I, we had a condo here. And because we knew we were making this transition, he was in California with the children, and I was here in Florida. And you know, the tongues were wagging, so there must be problems, and there were no problems. My husband and I, we made a decision. We had a conversation about our family. My children were already grown. Uh, they were already adults. They'd already finished school. And so, but they were still living at home because it's very expensive to live in Southern California. And so my family has been, I, I know that, and I would say they're all just like me. They just don't notice it. So it's been very, very difficult. I will tell you that, it's, I, uh, not difficult, but interesting. So I got a lot of help. We had, uh, I had a housekeeper. We had a live-in for about 11 years. And I remember once one of our neighbors, we lived in a, a great community in Los Angeles called Ladera Heights. And one of our neighbors, we were outside talking to the neighbors one day, and a neighbor asked me, why do you have a housekeeper? And I said, oh, well, you know, because I, I travel, and she's very, very helpful to us. And, you know, I, I needed the help. And she says, well, why isn't your husband the one doing the traveling and you stay home? <laughs> I said, well, you know, how, how do you broach that subject? I said, well, how do you explain to somebody that, number one, you've made this decision. Number two, it's my level of expertise. Number three, is I, we made a decision about what's good for the family. Number four, I had a, a teenage son at the time when we started, and, and he definitely needed to be there with his father. We made a decision. And we moved forward. And at that point, when I explained it to her, her husband said, she said to her husband, well, I think I need a housekeeper, too. And he said, why? <laughs> he said, why? And we started a family argument. <laughs> he said, why? We got a housekeeper. It's you. <laughs> so they, people with different ideas about that, but I, I believe in having help. But that's what I meant at the beginning about this. I would never want to want to paint the picture that everything was a bed of roses and that I have it all together. I had lots of help. When I heard my first child, my mother lived around the corner. She was at my house every single day. I made sales calls. Uh, we, we made the sacrifice, stay up all night. Uh, all, whatever it took, that's what we did to do the business. And I think that um, my family, that would be interesting to hear what they, I would love to hear them. I'm going to give you my sister's number. You need to call them and ask them. <laughs> well, you've given us a lot of valuable gifts in this interview. Um just ask one last thing. What do you think is the most valuable gift that you can give our listeners? The realization, if they can take it from my voice, that anything is possible. And I don't mean, I know that sounds trite, but it really all depends on what you are willing to do and what sacrifice you are willing to make or that you can make. I believe that nothing is easy, and you, once you make a commitment to be in business, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're working for, for someone else or you, and, or you are a leader, when you make that commitment, that you have to go all in. That, that there's no easy way to do it. I do think, however, I'd love to see different ideas come about. Like in our company, we have lots of young women, and then you have me and some other women that are my age that are there. And my thought is, why can't we share a shift so that the young women can go pick up their children from school at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and stay? Why can't we both learn? Why can't you have two women learn a job? One whose children are out of the house and another one who has young children, and you partner them and they work together um, on a project or in the office. And that way you always have coverage. That would be a great idea rather than having a woman make, have to make a choice that, well, you know, I've got to stay home because I want to be home with my children. Maybe we could figure that out. And I think that the more women that you have on board and in leadership, that we will come to make some of those really good decisions and come up with ideas so that we can all make a contribution without making such a sacrifice to the children and on the home front. And I challenge all of us, particularly our younger women, to help us solve that conundrum. Well, Beverly, you've just been terrific. Um, I've loved your interview, and thank you so much for spending the time. I know it's last minute, but it's so important that you were able to share the kinds of things that you did. So thank you so much. 
Lynn, thank you very much for asking me. Have a wonderful afternoon. This is Nan McKay. I hope you've enjoyed listening to another story of the impact of trailblazers. You can connect with us at hello at trailblazersimpact.com. If you or someone you know would like to join us on the show, send a bio to the email address and let us know why you feel the person would be a good addition to the show. And come again with us on the journey to explore the past to give new life to the future. Tune in to the Trailblazers Impact podcast then explore our website, trailblazersimpact.com. Remember, you must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be. 